Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing hypoxia-inducible factor. Okay, so we've discussed that hypoxia-inducible factor 1 is made up of two proteins, hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha and hypoxia-inducible factor 1 beta. And if you produce hypoxia-inducible factor 1, then you will initiate the response intracellularly uh, to hypoxic conditions. Okay? Now, the reason you don't usually initiate the response is because you don't usually have hypoxia-inducible factor 1 uh, complexes in the cell. And the reason is that hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha is usually degraded the moment it's, it's synthesized, basically. So hypoxia-inducible factor 1 beta is always present within the cytoplasm of cells, but hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha is not. And the reason isn't that it's not synthesized. It is synthesized, but the moment it is synthesized, it is destroyed. Okay, and we're di currently in the process of discussing how it is destroyed. So basically, We've discussed that hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha has this special domain known as the oxygen-dependent degradation domain, the ODD, okay? And within this oxygen-dependent degradation domain, you have proline 402 and proline 564. And these prolines will get hydroxylated on uh, their fourth carbon, like so, okay? And this process requires oxygen, okay? So this process will only occur in the presence of oxygen and in the presence of hypoxic conditions when there's a low oxygen then the reaction will not occur so the proteins will not get hydroxylated and the hydroxylation of the proteins is essential for the degradation of the hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha. So, we just want to discuss the enzymes which catalyze this reaction. So there are three. However, the enzymes which catalyze this reaction are far more complicated than that, but it's not, um, it's not that they actually are more complicated than that, it's that their naming systems are quite complicated. So basically, for each one of these three enzymes uh, which can catalyze uh, this hydroxylation of the proteins, there are three different names. So the first naming system is the prolyl hydroxylase domain enzyme naming system. Okay, so in this naming system, the enzymes which catalyze the hydroxylation of the proline residues are known as prolyl hydroxylase domain enzymes. Okay, and for short, prolyl hydroxylase uh, domain enzymes uh, are abbreviated to PhDs. Okay, and this is the most popular naming system for these enzymes. So there is PHD1, so prolyl hydroxylase domain enzyme 1, there is prolyl hydroxylase domain enzyme 2, and then finally there is prolyl hydroxylase domain enzyme 3. Okay, but there are other naming systems as well. So another naming system for these enzymes is the hypoxia inducible factor, the HIF prolyl hydroxylase. Okay, so you will also see these enzymes known as hypoxia-inducible factor prolyl hydroxylase enzymes. And for short, the hypoxia-inducible factor prolyl hydroxylase enzymes are abbreviated to the HPH enzymes. Now, what would be extremely simple is if PHD1 was called HPH1, and if PHD2 was called HPH2, and if PHD3 was called HPH3, but it is not that simple, unfortunately. PHD1 is called HPH3, okay? PHD2, thankfully, is called HPH2. PHD3, then, is called HPH1. So the numbers uh, swap around, basically, unfortunately. And it doesn't stop there. There is another name for these enzymes, and this is the most ridiculous one, okay? The other name is to call them the egg-laying-9 enzymes, okay? And for short, egg-laying-9 is abbreviated to EG for egg, L for laying, and then N for 9, so the egg-laying-9 enzymes, okay? And what numbering system do we have here? Well... PHD1, or HPH3, is also known as, whoops, egg-laying-9, 
and unfortunately it's the one remaining one, it's egg laying nine two. So it's got different numbers in all the different naming systems, unfortunately. Uh, PHD2 or HBH2 is also called egg laying nine one, so EGLN one. And then finally, uh, this means that PHD3 must also be called egg laying nine three. Okay, so there are these three different names for each one of these enzymes, basically, and that adds a little bit more confusion to these enzymes. But fundamentally, if you just pick your favourite naming system and acknowledge that the other naming systems make no sense, um, then you'll be fine. Okay, so uh, we will use the prolyl hydroxylase domain uh, naming system, the PHD naming system. So these PHD enzymes all catalyze the hydroxylation of these proline residues at position 402 and at 564 uh, on the uh, oxygen-dependent degradation domain of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha. Okay, and this is oxygen dependent though. We'll only do this in normoxic conditions. Now, how does this lead, then lead to the degradation of the hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha? So, okay, if we have our hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha here, then we now have uh, two hydroxylated proline residues. So let's put them here. Let's have them as fancy little purple portions here. Basically, once you have those hydroxylated proline residues, a certain protein can come and bind here. Okay, so a certain protein will only bind to hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha if the hydroxylated proline residues are present. And this protein is known as uh, the von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor protein. Okay, or PVHL, uh, uh, VHL rather. Okay, so whenever you see P in front of the name of a protein, it means that it's a tumor suppressor protein. So this means tumor suppressor protein, that's what the P is. So we'll put tumor suppressor protein, and then it's von Hippel-Lindau. So tumor suppressor protein, and it's named after a disease that's known as von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, or disease. Okay, so tumor suppressor protein, and then uh, von Hippel-Lindau and Hippel-Lindau has a dash between it like that so this is the tumor suppressor protein von Hippel-Lindau and I might even try and um, fit its abbreviation in there PVHL okay so what now will happen is that PVHL uh, will catalyze or at least it will act as an assembly for uh, the ubiquitin ligase enzymes uh, to come and bind onto the hypoxy, uh, hypoxic, uh, hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha pro uh, protein, and they will now add ubiquitin molecules on. So basically, once the tumor suppressor protein von Hippel Lindau is attached to the hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha, okay, you will get ubiquitin groups added onto. Uh, the um, hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. Okay, so ubiquitination follows. So ubiquitination is the process of adding ubiquitin groups onto something. So the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha is going to get ubiquitinated, and then things that get ubiquitinated are targeted for the proteasome. Okay, and the proteasome is a quite terrifying thing in the world of proteins. Uh, it's a tube, basically, and proteins go in one end, and amino acids, or at least small uh, polypeptide fragments, come out the other end. So what will happen is the ubiquitin will bind to the entrance of the proteasome, and it will f allow the feeding in of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha polypeptide through uh, the proteasome, and in the proteasome, you'll get cuts all over the place, basically, uh, which will break down this polypeptide into loads of little fragments, basically. And that, then, is how we destroy the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. Okay, so what we now need to discuss is what happens in hypoxic conditions. So in hypoxic conditions, you are not going to get the hydroxylation of those proline residues in the oxygen-dependent degradation domain of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. 
then uh, the tumor suppressor von Hippel-Lindau protein will not be able to bind to the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha, and you won't get the ubiquitination, and therefore you won't get the destruction. So without oxygen, the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha is not destroyed. It remains within the cell, and it can then dimerize uh, with the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-beta proteins, which are present in the cell all the time and create you a hypoxia-inducible factor 1 molecule. Now, what then does the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 molecule do within the cell? Well, basically, the complex is in the nucleus, and I should have actually said this. Okay, so, when the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha is stabilized, okay, so it isn't getting destroyed, it's initially in the cytoplasm. Okay, so let's say this is the nucleus of the cell. At the moment, the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha that has just been created, and this time hasn't actually been destroyed the instant it was created, this is in the cytoplasm. It will go into the nucleus, and in the nucleus, it meets hypoxia-inducible factor 1b, uh, or rather 1-beta, I should say. Okay, so hypoxia-inducible factor 1-beta is already in the nucleus. When you create the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha and don't destroy it, it then goes into the nucleus, joins the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-beta, and uh, forms this uh, heterodimer here. This is then going to act as what is known as a transcription factor. So let me just explain what a transcription factor is. So, let me draw a piece of DNA here. So, in eukaryotic cells, upstream of all genes, uh, you have what is known as a promoter region. So, let's say this here is a gene. So, this is a gene, uh, some arbitrary gene. Then, upstream of the gene, what you have is a special region known as the promoter region. And the promoter region is not involved in actually uh, being translated into protein. Okay, but it is involved in controlling the expression of the downstream gene. Okay, so I'll colour in the gene in red, and I'll colour in the promoter region in blue. So, basically, in order for you to actually make the protein that uh, is coded for by this gene, you need the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme to come and bind to the promoter region, then work its way along the DNA, produce a piece of mRNA, which will then leave the nucleus, go into the cytoplasm, and be translated into protein. Okay? So, it is the promoter region where the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme uh, binds, basically. So, how does this allow the promoter region to control uh, the expression level of the gene? Well, basically, if the promoter region has a high affinity for this enzyme, RNA polymerase 2, then RNA polymerase 2 will bind there all the time. It will work its way along the gene every time it binds and produce mRNA. So you'll get mRNA being produced all the time, so you'll produce a lot of mRNA for this gene. The mRNA will then be translated into a lot of protein, and you'll get a lot of protein for that gene. Whereas, if the promoter region has a very low affinity for binding the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme, then RNA polymerase 2 will bind there hardly ever. You won't get much mRNA being produced for that gene, and you won't therefore get much protein being produced if you don't have much mRNA. So, the affinity of the promoter region for binding to RNA polymerase 2 controls uh, the expression level of that uh, gene, basically. Now, a transcription factor is any molecule which binds to promoter regions and alters the affinity of the promoter region for binding to the RNA polymerase 2. So this, in orange here, is a transcription factor. Now, transcription factors can either be enhancers or they can be repressors because some transcription factors will bind to promoter regions and increase the affinity of the RNA polymerase 2 binding there, and therefore will increase the expression of the protein, whereas some will bind to the promoter region and decrease the affinity of the promoter region for RNA polymerase 2, and therefore RNA polymerase 2 will bind less, you'll get less mRNA being produced, and therefore less protein being produced. Now, Basically, transcription factors will bind to a huge number of promoter regions. So they might have a 
say, let's say, a hundred different genes uh, whose promoter regions they bind to. Now, if it's a trans transcription uh, factor that enhances the expression at one promoter region, it doesn't mean that it will enhance the gene expression at all the other 100 promoter regions. Basically, every transcription factor has a whole bunch of promoter regions it binds to, and at some of them it will enhance uh, the expression of the downstream gene by increasing the affinity of that promoter region for RNA polymerase 2, and at others it will decrease the affinity of that promoter region for RNA polymerase 2, and therefore will repress uh, the expression of that downstream gene. So transcription factors will increase the expression of some genes and decrease the expression of other genes. And this is what this hypoxia-inducible factor 1 is. It's a transcription factor, so it's going to increase the expression of some genes, decrease the expression of other genes. Now, what are some of the key genes that uh, have their expression increased? Well, one of the key genes that has its expression increased is the vascular endothelial growth factor A uh, gene. Okay, so this stands for vascular, that's the V. Uh, e is for endothelial and then the GF is for growth factor. And specifically, the main vascular endothelial growth factor is vascular endothelial growth factor type A. Okay, so this is one of the most powerful pro-angiogenic factors. Okay, so the cell will start secreting this vascular endothelial growth factor A, this VEGFA, uh, which will uh, act on capillaries nearby and cause angiogenesis to hopefully get new blood vessels uh, in this hypoxic area so that you'll have a greater oxygen delivery. Okay. In addition, you increase the expression of genes associated with enzymes uh, for anaerobic respirations. You're going to increase the expression of enzymes involved in anaerobic respiration. So the enzymes of glycolysis will have their expression increased. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of the hypoxia-inducible factor.